Sorry we're late. We're here now for the beginning of day four of Virtually Keswick Convention. And it's great to be with you, particularly if this is the first day that you've tuned in. So glad that you've tuned in. We've been having a fantastic week together. Personally, I've been well fed and encouraged by the Lord. And it's also been great to hear how the Lord's been speaking to you. He's been speaking to all of us across the different age groups. We've been loving having your comments come in. And we've got some of our favourites now uh, to show you. I love this first one that Graham, um, Arthur and Ooh sent in. <laughs> I think Ooh's the, the teddy bear, I think. Must be, must be. Getting ready for Hope Hunters with Daddy. Very sweet. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, I'm enjoying virtually Keswick Convention 2020 and count everyone in. It's my fourth year. What a fantastic solution for the circumstances. Lisa, thanks for sending that in. We're really glad you're appreciating uh, all that's being put out there. Cheers, Lisa. Grace Community Church in Tipton are fantastic. So they've been watching it together as a church and then Zooming afterwards. Very encouraged by Psalm 3 and the whole of the morning session. Thanks so much for sending it in, guys. What a great idea. This year, the message has a special depth and compassion, which I have personally found very helpful. Oh, well, we're so glad uh, it has been speaking to you and reaching you wherever you are. We are grateful that you've been sending in those encouragements too. Thank you. That's wonderful. Keep them coming. Wouldn't it be great if we weren't just hearers of God's word this week, but we were those Psalm 1 characters who meditate on it and who do it? Uh, I've got a plan just to set aside a bit of time uh, just to reflect on what I've learnt and to pray it in, and that might be something that could be helpful for you to do as well. Well, today we've got another great talk coming to you from Christopher Ash. He's going to be speaking to us uh, from Psalm 5. And we're thrilled to have Emu bringing us our sung worship uh, all this morning, as they have been this week. And later on this morning, we're going to have a seminar, which today is on the topic of sharing hope with friends. Uh, Andy Bannister is going to be live in the studio for a question and answer session afterwards, uh, along with Christy Mayer, who'll be joining us for that question session too. So do get thinking how, what you might like to ask them. We've also got our next instalment of Hope Hunters, the Keswick for Kids stream. And the Keswick Youth Programme is uh, online as well this morning. Go to the Virtually Keswick Convention website and you can click on those red or green tiles to take you to the right place. But now, let us uh, just spend some time in prayer together. Some words from Psalm 95. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Lord, we want to come before you, acknowledging our position before your throne, praising your power and authority in our lives, but also your tender, loving care of us, your lost sheep. Turn our hearts to you now, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well now, let us worship our King, our Maker, together in song.
Wonderful. In a moment, we're going to find out a bit more about Keswick Ministries. Did you know that Keswick Ministries' vision to inspire and equip Christians to serve the cause of Christ extends beyond this summer convention to events which run throughout the year? Or we'll be hearing a bit more about that in a moment. But before that, Jonathan Carswell is going to tell us about a very precious book indeed. As you'll know, a couple of weeks ago, our dear friend and brother, Peter Maiden, was called home to glory, to be with the Lord Jesus in heaven. Many of us will know Peter through his ministry. Perhaps we heard him speak here at Keswick or at many other conferences around the UK. Perhaps some of us have, have read his books. I remember even as a teenager reading Discipleship Matters, the impact that that left on me. I still feel today a wonderful book, a challenging book. Peter was a, a godly man, a man of integrity, a man of uh, compassion and, and love, a, a man who desired to share the gospel wherever he could go and point people to the Lord Jesus. A couple of years ago, Peter began writing a book called Radical Gratitude, something close to his heart that, again, he modelled in the way he, he went about his life. Gratitude is something perhaps we can get in our heads fairly easily, Maybe even the, the words of the, the, the worship song from the 90s sticks in our head. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Well, we get that in our mind, but to get it in our hearts and to live it out is, is challenging. So Peter set about writing a book that would help the church with this. During that time, Peter was diagnosed with uh, cancer, terminal cancer. And the question came, well, should he, should he not continue writing this book and just focus on his health? I'm really pleased that Peter continued to write because actually the message of the book is all the more pertinent, knowing what he was going through. Life was, was challenging. His health was a struggle. And yet Peter was determined that he would Give thanks in all circumstances, as the Bible commands us. I want to really warmly commend this book to you. To get it to, to read slowly and thoughtfully, bearing in mind what Peter was going through as he was writing this, and the message of God that he brings as he writes it. A challenge to each of us, who can so easily grumble and complain, but bearing in mind what the Lord has done for us, Wow, we've so much to give thanks for, haven't we? Peter has left us with a real legacy in many ways, but his books are one of those. And I want to really invite you to get to know Peter, sit under his ministry and be blessed by his books. Radical gratitude, I think, is going to help many of us take our eyes off ourselves, even in the midst of suffering, to look to the Lord Jesus and give thanks with a grateful heart. Over the last few years, Keswick Ministries has developed an annual program of teaching and training courses in the beautiful surroundings in the heart of the Lake District. Our vision's developed to extend into all year round ministry. That's the same vision that lies behind the Derwent Project. We're passionate about inspiring and equipping you as disciples of Jesus Christ to love and live for Christ in his world. Our prayer is that these courses will support the work of local churches, encouraging those who come to the convention and other Christians. In the last three years, hundreds have attended and benefited from the courses and workshops. The feedback has been excellent. 
I really love the opportunity this week to think about what leadership actually is, to have a whole week um, and time away from normal demands, thinking about leadership, but thinking about it especially from what leadership looks like as those who follow Jesus has just felt a real privilege, being reminded that ultimately in our jobs and in our lives, our identity is in Christ and everything flows out of that. Hi, my name's Toby. I attended the Keswick Bible Workshop on the book of Hebrews back in March. And it was a great day, really theologically stretching, uh, really helped me um, to make more sense of passages in Hebrews that I've been scratching my head over before um, and uh, showed me new meanings in other parts of the book of Hebrews that I hadn't seen before as well. But also a really heartwarming day. Uh, wonderful to, to see really clearly Jesus as our pioneer, that this, this idea in Hebrews that he is our trailblazer, who's walked the path before us and is getting us to glory. So a great day. Another innovative course we ran this year was online preaching. We set it up in response to the COVID crisis as it became apparent that preachers would find themselves preaching online with no notice, no training and no choice. Communications coach and leader of many preaching communication workshops, Richard Garnett, shared his expertise. I think for most preachers, COVID has come as a huge shock. Uh, if you're used to speaking to people in a room, to have to do it online has been really difficult. The rules of the game have completely changed. So for us to have been able to run three workshops via Zoom, an hour each with a uh, hundred preachers and to be able to give them something really concrete and tangible to be able to help them uh, navigate this time uh, has been really, really rewarding. We're currently finalising another exciting programme for the year ahead, including preaching, pastoral refreshment and engaging with science. And we're already taking bookings for the Emerging Leaders online workshop in October. This is aimed to equip the next generation of leaders in business, charity or the church. Are you a young leader who's passionate about living radically for Jesus and making an even greater difference for Christ in the place that he's called you to be, whether that's in the workplace or in a church or a charity? If so, you won't want to miss out on the Emerging Leaders Workshop, a unique online week this October with other emerging leaders from around the country and around the world as we wrestle with how to uh, hear God's word, how to live and become like God's son and how to serve God's mission exactly where he's called us to be. The details for this workshop and the other courses can all be found on the Keswick Ministries website. So we hope this one of these teaching and training courses specifically here for you, whatever your role or situation or ministry. You're passionate to hear God's word, to become like God's son and to serve God's mission. And one of these courses can really help you to be inspired and equipped to do just that. So do sign up on one of Keswick Ministries teaching and training courses. We look forward to seeing you there. Well, as you can see from that video, Keswick Ministries is not just a convention. Do see the Virtually Keswick Convention website for more information about all of those teaching and training courses. You can also have a look at the resources page for more information about that very special book recommendation. And if Johnny Cars Carswell didn't whet your appetite enough, let me just uh, share with you uh, the recommendation for, by Don Carson for this brilliant book, Radical Gratitude. Don says, in an age where whining has become a pandemic, when entitlement sits cheek by jowl with incessant, dubious claims of victimisation, Peter Maiden provides us with an alternative, a profoundly biblical alternative. In 12 short chapters, he not only exhorts his readers to thankfulness, but also fleshes out a plethora of reasons to be grateful. Well, uh, I can really highly recommend this book. It's a great one for you to get and look at. Well, as we're thinking about lamenting this morning and drawing near to God at times when it hurts, I certainly find music a great way of pouring out my emotions before the Lord. So we're going to hear again from Emu now as Liv Chapman introduces their new song, Take Heart. This song is for those of us who feel broken and hurting, to remind our hearts that we have a king who walks beside who bears our shame and carries our grief. And it's a song 
that helps us to wait and long for Jesus' return. Waiting one, with a great description of a Christian. Waiting one, take heart. I think that's a a very moving song. And if you've enjoyed the songs and you want to listen to them again, uh, just remind you that they're all accessible on our Virtually Keswick website and also on the YouTube channel. Now we're about to have our reading by Kirsten, who's an overseas missionary who's been coming with her family to the convention for a number of years now. Uh, Earlier, we asked Kirsten, why is it that she keeps coming year after year? As a family, we come to the Keswick Convention knowing that we will be reminded through God's word that a day is coming when the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Alleluia. We have been in a country where it can be difficult for local followers of Jesus to meet together, and at times there have been few other ambassadors for Christ and his kingdom. When we've gathered at Keswick with so many others, all one in Christ Jesus, we've had a taste of the praise and joy of that final day, and we have gone away longing for others to be with us in that great crowd. In the first Keswick convention I went to, Ronald Dunn spoke from Deuteronomy 8 with a message that has stayed with me almost 40 years. Moses wrote to remind the people that God is leading, even in wilderness wanderings, humbling and feeding us. 
teaching us that we do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We are so thankful for the way God has fed and encouraged us through the Bible ministry of Keswick. Wonderful encouragement there from Kirsten. And we're going to have God's word read and preached now, but just before we do, let's pray. Psalm 119 verse 1 says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Father, we ask that as Christopher brings us Psalm 5, that you would show us afresh the immaculate blamelessness, the perfect righteousness of your son, King Jesus. And we ask that as your spirit speaks to us through your word, that you would be enabling us to follow Jesus more faithfully and truly make us more like him. We ask this not for our glory, but for his alone. Amen. Amen. Psalm 5 To the choir master for the flutes, a psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favour as with a shield. Well, good morning on this Thursday morning. I want to speak with you this morning from a psalm which addresses the question of the relationship between you and me and evil. And you say to me, well, that's a very odd question. Evil is evil. I'm against it. Of course, I'm against it. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And I try to be a good person. Of course, I'm against evil, except when I'm not. And then I try to redefine it and I find ways of justifying what I've done or said. I can always find a reason for that. But I most certainly condemn bad people. I shout against them. I tweet against them. I tear down their statues. I certainly don't approve of bad people. Now, this psalm, Psalm 5, doesn't make any sense ultimately apart from Jesus Christ. I think that's true of all the Psalms, but it's very true of this one. 
It's a psalm which has, if I can put it simply, goodies and baddies. We'll go through it slowly in a moment, but let me just take you on a very quick tour, uh, just just to, to get a feel for how you might misread it. Verses 1 to 3, David, who's obviously the main goody of the psalm, he says, I'm going to pray. And you think, well, that's good. He's going to pray. Good on you, David. Then in verses 4 to 6, he says, I'm going to pray because you, O oh God, you don't like those bad people out there. There are lots of bad people out there, and you certainly don't like them. And I'm glad you don't like them because obviously I'm not one of them. No, verses 7 and 8. Uh, I, I'm going to come into your house to be with you where I belong. Because, verses 9 and 10, there's some very bad people out there, almost unbelievably bad, awful people out there. But no, verses 11 and 12, we, righteous people, we're going to enjoy being with God. So there's this oscillation, this swinging to and fro in the psalm, good, bad, good, bad, good. And uh, we naturally assume that we can put ourselves in David's shoes. I'm going to pray, says David, and we say, well, yes, that's a good idea. I'm going to pray. There are bad people out there. Yeah, there really are. Uh, 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 And then I'm going to come into God's presence. Yeah, I'll come into God's presence because there are bad people out there. There are certainly bad people out there. But no, no, David says we're going to enjoy being with God. And I say, yeah, that's me. But there's there's a catch. There's a hiccup. There's a fly in the ointment. Just have a look with me before we launch into the psalm at the end of verse 9. Last two lines of verse 9, where where David says of some people, their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. If you've been a Bible reader for some years, you may recognize those words from the New Testament. In Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 3, he says, I'm going to make the case that everybody, whether they're religious or not religious, everybody, whoever they are, is under sin, under the power of sin. And then he he quotes a number of Old Testament uh, texts to demonstrate that, including this one, their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. So the problem with identifying with the goodies in this psalm is that the New Testament says that you and I are with the baddies. It says that everybody is, by nature, we're lined up with the baddies. And the New Testament says that when I condemn those bad people out there, my condemnation has a boomerang quality, and it has a way of flipping around and coming back and coming back to me. So there's this catch. And it's really difficult, isn't it? You watch a film or a movie, you naturally identify with the goodies. I haven't met anyone reading The Lord of the Rings who says, I feel that the Nazgul, the ring wraiths, I feel that that's me, or Sauron is me. Of course not. We all say, well, I, I want to be Frodo or Aragorn or Gandalf or maybe Sam Gamgi. Of course we do. And the problem with Psalm 5 is that I'm on the wrong side of it, and so are you. Now, if you read Psalm 5 the way I caricatured it at the beginning, you'll become a Pharisee. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like those bad people out there. No, no, I come to the Keswick Convention. I'm a good person. And of course, lots of people who wouldn't call themselves Christians think that that's what Christians are, that we just think we're better than other people. And before we launch into this psalm, we need to be very clear in our mind of that message of the New Testament, that it's only through faith in Jesus Christ that we can hope in any way to be on the right side of the psalm, and that there is a righteousness that comes from God that can be given to us in Christ, that Jesus is the only man in human history who could simply say Psalm 5 without any hypocrisy or pretense or Pharisaism, because that precisely describes him on the right side of the psalm. You know, the wonderful thing is that actually the way we pray it, which is in Christ, clothed with the righteousness of Christ, is the same way in principle that David prayed it. David was guilty of the things he talks about in this psalm, the bad things. And he can only pray it because of the righteousness of God given to him, ultimately because Jesus will come. 
It's a wonderful thing in church history that Martin Luther rediscovered the great truth of the righteousness of God given to us by grace alone and received through faith in Jesus Christ alone. He rediscovered it. It was an old truth, of course, a Bible truth and a truth that some of the early church fathers knew. But he rediscovered it first when he gave lectures on the Psalms. He'd rediscovered it later in Romans and Matthew and Hebrews and other places. But he first rediscovered it in the Psalms, that righteousness comes from God alone. So I, I, I'm sorry about that long preamble, but it's really important that we read this, this psalm, conscious that it's only in Christ that we can safely pray it. I'm going to take it in those five sections, one to three, and then four to six, and then seven and eight, and then nine and ten, and then eleven and twelve. And we'll move through them fairly fast. Verses one to three, David says, I'm going to pray. And, and he, he begins to pray, but he tells us more about how he prays. And so he says at the beginning, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. And that word groaning is very striking. It's, it's, it has that sense that when we pray, we speak words, but the words are like, as Spurgeon once put it, they're the clothing. And underneath the clothing is the groaning of our hearts, one Old Puritan said, in time of trouble, the heart has more to say than to God than words can utter. And what a man cannot express, the Lord will take knowledge of it, no less than of his words. So there's a groaning of the heart and a speaking of words and a cry. There's an urgency there. And in verse 3, David says something very striking. O Lord, in the morning, twice he says in the morning, Psalm 4 ended with David saying, I'll lie down and sleep. And there's something rather appropriate. The the next psalm has this reference to the morning. We don't know if he wrote it the next morning. He may or may not have done. But there's something rather appropriate this. In the morning, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you or I prepare my prayers for you. It's a word that literally means I, I, I prepare. Sometimes it's used of getting ready a sacrifice, um, getting the the wood and everything all ready for an Old Testament sacrifice. Sometimes it's used of preparing words. uh, But the point is, it's a careful word. In the morning, I prepare. I think about what I'm going to do with God. I think about my prayers. And David did that. Jesus certainly did that. You might think of Jesus using Psalm 5 in his morning times of prayer with the Father. And that beautiful picture, I prepare. I'm going to think about it. I'm not going to rush my prayers. I'm going to lay my requests before you carefully. And it's a lovely picture. And I'm going to lay them before you and prepare them and so on. And then I'm going to watch. And that little word watch at the end of verse 3, it's like I'm going to... I'm going to send off the request for help. It's like a watchman on the walls of a city, a besieged city. I'm going to send off the request for help, and then I'm going to watch. I'm going to look, and I'm going to watch for that dust in the distance that shows that rescue is coming. It's a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus praying, groaning, preparing his prayers, and then watching for his Father's answer. And the New Testament says that the Lord Jesus leads a groaning church and a groaning creation in Romans chapter 8. Groaning, waiting, longing, watching, hoping for God to put this world to rights. You and I can only pray because Jesus prayed. We can only pray because Jesus first prayed this psalm. David could only pray this because Jesus would pray it. And it's something here for us before we move on. I wonder what you're like, whether in the morning you pray. I know that in my case, it would be more like, I don't really prepare my prayers. I rush into a few prayers. My wife and I pray together, but we might rush it quite quickly sometimes. Might look at the Bible a little bit, pray a quick prayer, and then I forget all about what I've prayed. How wonderful to prepare, to think about the prayers we're going to pray 
to lay them before our Heavenly Father with care and thoughtfulness, and then to watch and wait and see what our Heavenly Father will do by way of answer. So there's the, the preparation. Now, verses 4, 5, and 6. David says, I'm going to pray because, verse 4, you're not a God who delights in wickedness. And delights is the same word. You get it in Psalm 2, uh, Psalm 1, of the man who delights in the law of God. And, and here is a God who does not delight in wickedness. He doesn't like it. Evil can't dwell with you. And the word dwell means even a fleeting visit in our lockdown terms. Evil can't even come and meet you briefly in your garden. Even can't, evil can't even get close to you, um, God. Now, it's a good thing that the true God, if there is a true God, doesn't delight in evil. This world would be a terrible place if God delighted in evil. And Plenty in, in human history, plenty of gods and goddesses and spirits and religions and philosophies have actually delighted in evil in one way or another. Think of some of the big atheist philosophies of the 20th century, communism. So often it has delighted in evil. Some years ago, I went to a British Museum exhibition about Moctezuma, the last ruler of the Aztecs in the early 16th century. Uh, and, and in the audio guide, the director of the museum was lamenting that a sophisticated Native American civilization was destroyed by the incoming Europeans. And of course, that's what we like to think. But actually, when you went around the museum, you discovered that their civilization, if you can call it that, was built on worshipping a god of aggressive warfare. That's what you did. You had to. And if you're a man, you had to fight and you had to draw blood and you had to kill people. You had to do human sacrifice. That's what their God wanted them to do. And I find myself thinking, I'm not sure I'm as sad as all that, that that went away. It's a terrible thing when people think that's what God wants. But God does not like that. He doesn't like boastfulness, verse 5, boasting about who I am. He doesn't like evil doing. He doesn't like lies. He doesn't like bloodthirst. He doesn't like deceit. He hates all that. David knew that. He believed that God hated that. David was right. But there were times in David's life when David did all those things. I was reading this morning, just this morning in my Bible reading, that dreadful story in 2 Samuel chapter 11, how David abuses his power as king to sleep with Bathsheba, the beautiful wife of one of his most loyal servants, and then arranges for for, for, for the husband to get killed in war. It's a terrible picture. Makes some of the worst Hollywood film producers seem like angels by comparison. So there were times when David was guilty of all these things. Jesus alone believed that God hated these things and lived by it every day. Jesus could say to the Father, you hate pride, may my heart be humble. And his heart was humble. You hate evil actions, and he went about doing good. You hate lies, and he always spoke the truth. You hate bloodthirst, and he always loved his neighbor as himself. You hate deceit, and he was always trustworthy. And in the Lord Jesus, you and I are called upon to begin to transfer from being people who by nature do all those things and to begin to walk with the righteous one and to hate those things and to, to flee from them. But then verse 7 and 8, we swing across. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, the overflowing love that God gives to us ultimately in Jesus, the abundance of that covenant love, I'm going to enter your house. It's Old Testament language, the temple, the tabernacle, the place where God dwelt in Old Testament language. I'm going to bow down there in the fear of you, in reverent fear. I'm going to love you and be with you. And, and there's something here, it's not pharisaical. There's something very beautiful. In our church at home, we now have Bishop Timothy Dudley Smith, probably the most famous hymn writer of the 20th century. He's in his 90s now. And some years ago, he was reminding me the other day uh, on the phone that he, he, he wrote a book called Someone Who Beckons. It's a lovely devotional book. And that's the Bible truth, that there is a God who beckons and who has abundant, steadfast love. And he says to us, come, come into my house, come 
dwell with me. And there's a, there's a wonderful Father's love there. Jesus, the Son, knew that love. He knew what it was to be loved by the Father. The Father beckoned to him. He came. He dwelt. He lived. He loved. And in the Lord Jesus, countless men and women who by nature are all verses 4 and 5 and 6 people, because we all are, by nature, we've heard that invitation to come into God's presence. And most wonderfully, we can do that because of Jesus. But then he prays, verse 8, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. David is surrounded by enemies, just as years later, Jesus will be surrounded by enemies. And David knows, and Jesus knows, that the worst thing the enemies can do is not to hurt him. The worst thing they can do is to lead him into sin. And so he says, lead me in your righteousness. Whatever happens, whatever the suffering, however hard it is, and you and I are called to this as we follow Jesus, however hard it is, lead me in your righteousness to walk in ways of righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight. That means morally upright before you. And it's really hard, isn't it? If somebody treats you badly, I think of a friend of mine who's been badly treated uh, by a former work colleague, and you naturally want to get your own back. You naturally want to hit back. You think, well, two can play at that game. I can get my own back at them. And we need to pray this. As Jesus prayed me, lead, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of your, my enemies. There's a lovely old hymn by the Scottish hymn writer Horatius Bonar. Thy way, not mine, O Lord. And one of the verses goes like this. The kingdom that I seek is thine. So let the way that leads to it be thine. Else I must surely stray. And we, we say, verses 7 and 8, we say, yes, I'm going to accept that gracious invitation, the abundance of that steadfast love. I'm going to come into the presence of God with the Lord Jesus, coming into my Father's presence, and I'm going to pray that I walk right. But then in verses 9 and 10, we swing back. It's a psalm of these vigorous swings. And in verses 9 and 10, David swings us back to the picture of what's going on in the world, all of us by nature. There's no truth. And truth means solidity, reliability, something trustworthy. There isn't truth in their mouth. You can't trust them. And you and I live in a world where truth is held very cheap. I don't know who you follow on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or what news feeds you get. I was asking a friend from another country what news feeds she reads. She mentioned two really well-known ones in her country. And she said they're both terrible, but they're terrible in different ways. And you get these news feeds and you think, I, I, I wish I knew the truth. I read two major uh, sources of news at the moment, and it's very rare that they'll tell me the same thing. You long for a world of truth. There's no truth in their mouths. But it's not just their mouths, verse 9. Their inmost self, uh, which is the core of their being, is destruction. It's, it's like a picture of a chasm. You go right inside like, a, like a, a kind of spiritual surgeon. And you look right inside my heart, and what you find is a kind of aching chasm or destruction and a, a, a great emptiness. But it gets worse. The third line, their throat is an open grave. Oh, but I've never seen an open grave. An open grave in a hot country is a terrible thing. I've, I've smelt rotting meat. And I guess that's what you get with an open grave before very long, is the stench is disgusting. And their throat is an open grave. It, it has the sense that when they speak in the nose of God, it stinks. Uh, and it may also have the sense that actually their throat is about to swallow you into an open grave. If you spend too much time in their company, that's what's going to happen. It's, just, it's a horrible picture. It's a picture of a uh, what John Chrysostom, one of the church fathers, called a rotting soul, something stinking deep inside. But the frightening thing, I think, is the last line in verse 9, because they don't sound like that. You get that disgusting picture, and then the last line, they flatter with their tongue, and flatter means it's smooth. 
You, 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 you listen to them on the radio, you watch them on a chat show, you read them in a blog, you hear them on a podcast, you listen to them on a TED talk, perhaps even a pastor or a church leader sometimes, and it's smooth, it's persuasive. Everybody says it's good and it's nice and it's wonderful and it's impressive. But in the nose of God, it smells like rotting flesh. And there's something terrible about that picture. One of the church fathers says in the churches, it's people who speak Christ, but hide the antichrist. There's something terrible about that. It's horrible. And that's what you're like by nature. And it's what I'm like by nature. And so David prays, make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. And the Lord Jesus most wonderfully bore the guilt and the penalty of the sin of those for whom he came to die. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But at the end of time, those who will not find the forgiveness of Jesus and trust in that will fall. They'll fall by their own counsels because evil devours its own, has a way of eating up its own. And then David speaks of the abundance of their transgressions, not the abundance of your steadfast love, but a new abundance, just overflowing evil and wickedness and transgressions. And he prays, cast them out. Old Testament language, out of the promised land. New Testament language, out of this created order out of the new heavens and the new earth, uh, out because they've rebelled against you. Now, people say, well, I I don't like that kind of thing. We want inclusivity. That's one of the great mantras of our day. We want inclusivity. But actually, the Bible says, if the new heavens and the new earth are going to be worth living in, then they've got to have these things excluded from them. And they've got to have people living in them who've been purified and changed by the grace and the abundance of the steadfast love of the Lord Jesus. And the book of Revelation says in the most beautiful passage we had in church just the the other week in Revelation 21, where every tear is wiped from from the eyes of, of the people of God. In that same passage, there's a portrayal of people who will not turn from their evil who are outside, and they must be outside, or the new heavens and the new earth wouldn't be worth living in. So there's a horror here and a shrinking from sin. But the psalm ends in the last two verses with a joy, and it swings back from this picture of ugliness and stench. And uh, you have this lovely conclusion, but... Let all who take refuge in you rejoice. We had that back in Psalm 2. Blessed are all who take refuge in God's King, God's Christ, God's Son. He he beckons, he gives the invitation to all who will come. And let all who take refuge. You know, to be a Christian, if you've been a Christian for a while, you'll know this. To be a Christian is not to think you're better than anybody else. To be a Christian is to be a man or woman who is taking refuge in Jesus in a world in which we need to take refuge. Take refuge. And he says, as he prays for his people, he says, let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. It's a dangerous world. We get taken through dark and difficult days. But we can rejoice if we take refuge in him. Spread your protection over them so that those who love your name may exult in you. There's there's an exuberant gladness there. And the Lord Jesus, our King, prayed exactly that in John chapter 17. He said, Father, keep them, protect them, spread your protection over them, guard them. They're in a world in which there'll be all sorts of pressures not to follow the good way. Guard them. Guard them so that whatever they're called upon to go through, they will walk in righteousness. Because, verse 12, you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. Actually, it's singular in verse 12. You bless the righteous one. You cover him with favor as with a shield. 
And there's something rather wonderful there. The righteous one, ultimately the Lord Jesus, the righteous one. Father, you bless him and you cover him with a shield. And yet the New Testament says that if we belong to Jesus, you get this in the great Keswick Convention verses in uh, Galatians chapter 3, uh, that the people of God is one, Christ, one seed of Abraham, and all of us in Christ Jesus, one in Christ Jesus. You bless the righteous, you bless the Lord Jesus, you bless all who belong to Jesus, and in Christ this psalm is ours. Now as we make this psalm, and I hope you will, a part of your prayer life, you might like to pray through it later, go with the swings from, from one side to the other, to the other, to the other, because it swings and swings. When you are rejoicing in the side of those who trust in David the believer, in the Lord Jesus our King, in those who trust in Jesus, rejoice. But don't be pharisaical or self-righteous. When you see the portrayals uh, of evil and wickedness, say to yourself and say to God, that's what I am by nature. That's what I was. I was just walking that way. And you've rescued me from that. The seeds of that are still there in my heart. And I need to pray that you'll lead me in ways of righteousness. Uh, make your way straight before me that I may do that. And then it's a glad psalm. It's a glad psalm if you belong to Jesus. It's a glad psalm if you can pray it clothed with the righteousness of Christ. It's a glad psalm as you look realistically at the deceit and the bloodthirst and the ugliness and the selfishness and the hard things in the world. But it's a glad psalm because there is refuge and protection in God's King. And I want to commend that psalm to you and to pray that for you, as it is to me, it might be a psalm that speaks to your heart and soul and that you can use in your prayers. Let's be quiet as we have done on the other days and uh, just have a moment of silence and then I'll close with a prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We think of him in his morning times of prayer, preparing, praying, watching. And we want to pray in his name, clothed in his righteousness, confessing to you that by nature all this ugly evil is us, and yet thanking you for the righteousness of the Lord Jesus given to all who accept his beckoning invitation and call. And we pray that we might be one of those of that number who rejoice and exult with great joy uh, in the protection and the kindness and the goodness and the leading in righteousness that you promise to all who belong to Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Thank you, Christopher. Well, as Christopher so helpfully pointed out, the only way we can pray this psalm to identify as one of the righteous is through Jesus Christ. By being in him, we can claim his righteousness. He alone is indeed our cornerstone. So let's sing that song together. Christ alone, cornerstone.
Amen. Amen indeed. Well, through whatever storm you might be facing, Christ is indeed Lord. And through his blood and righteousness, we can pray together the words of Psalm 5. So let's pray together now. <coughs> Lord, spread your protection over us. Surround us with your favour as with a shield. Lead us in your righteousness. Make your way straight before us. Amen. Amen. One of the things I love about the Keswick Convention is that over the years, there's been no formal charge to coming to the convention. Our funding relies on the generosity of God's people. And what that means is that if you can't afford to give much or anything at all, you can still benefit from the ministry. But those who can afford to give more do. And can we just say that we are so grateful for those who have supported us in our gospel ministry and who continue to support us financially. But this is an unusual year for us all, and Keswick Ministries is no exception. Our prediction is that by the end of the year, we'll have a shortfall of about £200,000. And if you are able and would like to give to support us in our gospel ministry, do go to the VKC website, click on the donate button where you can find out a bit more about our financial situation and how you can partner with us in being a blessing and an encouragement and an equipping ministry to God's people. Well, as we come up to a slightly shorter coffee break, do pop the kettle on, grab your favourite mug, and then you can choose from a number of different options. Stick with us here for our seminar, which today is on the topic of sharing hope with our friends. It's by Andy Bannister, Director of Solar Centre for Public Christianity, and Christy Mayer, who is a research fellow at Oak Hill and lecturer in apologetics, philosophy and ethics. But together they're going to be exploring what's unique about the Christian hope. And they're going to offer us some really practical tools for how to talk to our friends and neighbours. They'll be joining us for a question session afterwards, so do text in uh, on the number with any queries that you might have for them. We've also got the next instalment of Hope Hunters, our Keswick uh, for Kids programme and the Keswick Youth programme, both of which can be accessed via the virtually Keswick Convention website. Just click on the red or the green tabs. Or you can catch up with any sessions that you might have missed from earlier in the week on that website too. But for now, let's just take a few minutes and uh, we will be back here at 11.15 for that seminar. <laughs> Get thanks and sing and try and sing. 
Well, welcome back. Great to have you joining us. I hope you've got fueled up with your caffeine and your snacks. Have you got a favourite biscuit? John T, what's your favourite biscuit? Uh, probably ginger nut, uh, but I can't resist party ring rings either. Party ring? How about oh, you? That is next level biscuit. Ah, I love a chocolate digestive all day long. I could eat the whole pack. Quality. Uh, if you're tuning into the kids and youth streams, uh, do go to the VKC website and just use the red and green button. But our seminar today, well, it couldn't be more relevant. Maybe like me, over the last few um, months and weeks, you've been looking around at your friends who don't know Jesus, and you've been saddened, saddened by the lack of hope that they have in light of an uncertain future. Also, maybe like me, you've felt like you, you just need a bit more equipping to share your hope with them. Well, our two guests today um, couldn't be more qualified to talk to this is issue. 
Today we're going to be joined by Andy Bannister, who is the director for um, the Soda Centre of Public Christianity, also, also an adjunct speaker for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Basically, he spends loads of time talking to people <laughs> about Jesus. He'll be with Christy Mayer, who spent many years with uh, students working for UCCF, equipping them to talk to people about Jesus. But currently, she's a research fellow at Oak Hill Theological College, um, lecturing in philosophy, apologetics, and ethics. Unsurprisingly, their topic for today is hope and sharing with friends. And we're going to hand over to Andy and Christy now. Well, it's uh, great to be with you at Virtually Keswick, isn't it, Christy? And uh, we're really excited to be digging into the topic in this seminar of how we can share hope with friends. And so really big topic, really big issues around that, especially with the pandemic and coronavirus. So, Christy, how can we begin thinking about that topic of hope, especially in today's uh, complicated world that we find ourselves in? That's such a great question. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I was chatting with one of my friends the other week. She doesn't yet know Jesus. And when I asked her how she was doing during these unusual times, I was quite taken aback to hear her answer. She's from a middle class background, materially wealthy, excellent job, uh, loved, well known, large family, part of the community, respected, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, all those good things. And I half expected her to say that she was really enjoying furlough you know, extra time to knit, be with her close family with whom she lives, read, write, uh, you know, make the most of lockdown. But what she actually said to me was that she couldn't talk to me right then and there because life was so overwhelming that she just had to go back to bed. And it's, it's rather funny, but that is the reality. And I'm sure that my friend isn't alone in experiencing that existential weight of fear and uncertainty that makes us question why we're getting up out of bed each day. Perhaps you felt it and maybe maybe you feel that right now, perhaps you feel precisely the same way. Uh, one speaker recently put it as a bubbling up of brokenness, you know, when all of those usual activities or perhaps distractions that have occupied our days like school runs, business trips, office meetings, you know, day trips, meals out, theatre, when all those things have been removed and we're just left with the four walls and the drum of our hearts beating by the moments and minutes, there's no escape. We cannot run away from ourselves. It's as one philosopher, Nietzsche, said, you looked for the heaviest burden you could find and it was you. Who can ever be rid of you? Uh, the pandemic has created room for our, for our brokenness to bubble up in ourselves and in the lives of our non-Christian friends and family. So as those layers of self-sufficiency are stripped away, after all, you know, who can outrun a global threat? Many are experiencing that heavy burden of being, that heavy burden of being themselves. You know, what hope is there? We cannot run away from ourselves and there's nothing to run towards either. Secularism, according to Humanists UK, in part, is a commitment to the principle of establishing a neutral public space in which all can meet on equal terms, regardless of religious beliefs. And there's a, there's a lot to say on this, but I just like to focus on one big thing. And that's the reality that there is no neutral public space. To believe that there is, is one of the biggest, most devastating deceptions of late modernity because we're all worshippers, aren't we? The only question is, what will we worship? Our secular state has created substitutions for God, you know, idols, uh, false gods. And the thing about these false gods is that we're told that they will break our hearts. This is what we're seeing. Nations, industries, economies, they rise and fall. Relationships in lockdown, they're bending and breaking. Inquiries into divorce have risen by 54% from March and domestic abuse and violence has risen. Many have lost or they will lose their jobs. And of course, you know, we can't forget this. Hundreds of thousands of people have died globally and over a million have been ill. The secular gods, the things usually run to hope and for happiness, like retail therapy, an extra glass of wine, a weekend away in Malaga, or Malaga, commanding the respect of a boardroom, one's investment portfolio, marital bliss, uh, the, the freedom of singleness, health, they're all being toppled much more visibly than usual. 
in the West, it's like we've been walking up these stairs of progress. And just as we're about to put our foot down on that next step, it was removed suddenly. We've lost our footing, we've tripped over and we've fallen down. These empty spaces of materialism and consumerism are far from empty and nor are they neutral. The, the thinker Jamie Smith gives us an example of malls, shopping centres as cathedrals of worship. It's where the faithful gather to find holy objects, which they then present before the checkout altars presided by priests of sale assistants and cashiers. And this space is not neutral. It's profoundly religious. He says it's a religion of transaction, of communion and exchange. The things that made in this secular space cannot heal us at our time of need. Where are they? You know, the doors are closed, everyone has been sent home, they've shut up shop and abandoned their worshippers just when they've needed them the most. Secular gods make poor lovers. They leave us when we need them the most. Chris, you've done a really powerful job there, I think, critiquing secularism and showing how those secular hopes simply don't work. So, OK, let's uh, now turn to the Christian faith. How does how does Christian hope look different than those false gods of secularism? Yeah, thanks for asking, Andy. I was scrolling through some articles the other day, and you've probably come across this too, Andy, but they spoke of how sales of the Bible have risen by about 55% in April, and there was a similar upswing in the number of downloads of the Bible app. And I just wonder why, why is that? Why have Google searches on prayer and Christianity skyrocketed during COVID-19? And, you know, I know it sounds a bit strange, but I do wonder if it comes back to Nietzsche's predicament. What do we do with our heaviest burden? Rather than shutting up shop, as the secular gods have done, the Son of God has made his home with us. And this is what makes Christianity unique, and therefore the Christian hope we are given by our triune God. Christian hope is unique. You've probably heard it said before, but it's you know, it's like a glorious diamond and you, know, you hold it up to the light and there are just so many different sparkling, equally just glorious facets to it. But here's the centermost point of that diamond. Christian hope is unique because Jesus is unique. He is the God who refuses to watch the world burn and in love makes his home with humans so that we can know his father. And Peter calls the hope that he has given us a living hope. In his letters, Peter is encouraging persecuted, displaced, suffering Christians what true hope looks like. And as he does that, he lets us in on what is unique about Jesus and therefore what is unique about the hope he offers us in himself. The letter of 1 Peter is littered with it. And I just love to read a couple of verses uh, from the first chapter of Peter. So I'm just going to draw our gaze to the verses uh, three to five, uh, where it writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So Jesus is giving us a living hope through the resurrection. He hasn't given us a dead hope. It's not like a new iPhone, which looks amazing, it's great, but then you open it up and then for some reason it just won't turn on. Jesus isn't a dud. He gives us a hope that turns on and in God's power actually keeps us going, trusting until we receive the full inheritance. But how, you know, how does Jesus actually do that? Jesus gives us a living hope, not a dead hope, because he triumphed over the grave. The living hope doesn't point to an uncertain outcome. It's not one that may or may not make it. You know, it's not like blagging it on a job interview, you know, just thinking, go for it. It may or may not work out. It's not the lockdown optimism of embarking on those challenging DIY projects, you know, thinking you hope it might come together. And if it doesn't, you can just call it shabby chic. Instead, with Jesus, what he has put in we get to cash out, we get to withdraw that with confidence because he's already done it. He's gone ahead of us and made a way and we only need to walk weakly behind him. This is a hope then that will follow us through all the trials of life and even our own deaths because Jesus is alive right now. The outcome isn't a gamble. It isn't hanging in the balance based on how good we've been or how productive we've been during lockdown. 
The Christian hope is a uniquely secure hope for us because no other hope is able to pierce the darkness and come through brighter on the other side. The small lights of the secular gods, as we've seen, are quickly blown out by any small wind of suffering. When it comes to Jesus, the winds blow, they often howl, but because Jesus lives, the darkness is not the end if we have been given the living hope of his life. And as Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus then, unlike the secular gods, will not leave us when things get a little rough, when we feel a little bit grumpy, when we face financial ruin, despair, ruined marriages and uh, relationships. He is the lover of our souls, to whom we can give our greatest burden ourselves. We do not have to carry the crippling weight of life. And this is more than a personal hope. This is a hope for the whole of the world. This is a hope that shines for all people in all places. A hope for a messy, hurting, bruised world. A hope that will restore and renew the earth. As overwhelmed as my friend is feeling through fear and uncertainty, there is another better way for her in Jesus. So what do we do with that heaviest burden? How do we point others to the place where their burden can be removed? And, you know, a little bit like Pilgrim and Pilgrim's Progress, experience the relief of its release. Enjoy a secure and certain hope in Jesus. Because after all, Andy, is it even possible to do evangelism right now? Let's be honest, for uh, many of us, evangelism is tough at the best of times. Even when life is running normally, many Christians were fearful about sharing our faith at work, at home, at school with our neighbours and so forth. Now, of course, in uh, recent months, evangelism has become even tougher. What with the uh, lockdown and restrictions, uh, that's limited who we can meet and made evangelism much harder. Although it's also given those of us who are nervous about evangelism a great excuse. You know, I'd love to go and do some evangelism, uh, but a shame, right? The government simply won't let me. Well, there's also the temptation uh, in these days, both for individual Christians, but also for churches, if we're not careful, to allow evangelism to drop somewhat down our priority list, to invest all of our time and energy into focusing on our own needs, our own spiritual concerns. In the case of churches, all of our energy goes into keeping our structures going. But we need to remember that the gospel imperative is, is outward. It's not inward. Jesus uh, didn't say, go and make disciples, but, you know, you can wait until it's easier to do so. So what about, instead of thinking of what we can't do, uh, given the pandemic, what about we turn it around and we think about what we can do in terms of evangelism? You know, one of my favourite uh, books of the Bible during these days has been the book of Philippians. Um, Paul is a terrific inspiration there because there he is uh, in prison, chained up between two Roman soldiers. And he doesn't spend his time uh, worrying and whinging and complaining. Oh, you know, I can't go and do another missionary travel. But rather, he turns it into an opportunity. I can share my faith with my guards. And he tell, describes in Philippians the incredible opportunity that his chains have opened up and how the gospel has spread uh, among all of the prison and even Caesar's household. So for us in these uh, pandemic days, let's ask ourselves the question, rather not what we can't do, but are there opportunities created by COVID-19 uh, for evangelism? And I, I think there are. Let me share some ideas drawn in part from Healthy Faith, uh, the book that I and Christy and a few others wrote for, uh, for IVP a few months ago. And I'm sharing a few ideas from my chapter on evangelism in that book. And I want to suggest that the first thing we can do, the first thing that's uh, crucial uh, in terms of evangelism and sharing hope right now is we need to pray. I know that sounds obvious, but I want to encourage you to pray particularly uh, for one particular thing. Pray specifically for opportunities. Pray that the Lord would open up opportunities for you to share the kind of hope that Christie's talked about. You can also pray that the Lord uh, reveals to you perhaps opportunities that you hadn't noticed right under your nose for evangelism. Secondly, uh, take the time, if you haven't already, to get to know your neighbours. My wife and I live in a community where most people, most of the time, keep themselves uh, shut away indoors and we don't see them. But actually, since lockdown, we've noticed we've seen people more. People appear more than their front gardens more often. More people are walking around our local streets than ever before. People are craving human contact. So why not look for opportunities to get to know people right there in your community? Be very non-British and say hello to people you meet. Invite neighbours around uh, for a barbecue, now that's allowed, or a socially distant, distant piece of cake. 
Hospitality is an amazing and often overlooked evangelism opportunity. Third, take the time to interact uh, with the people that you come across every day, the Amazon delivery driver, the postman, the, the checkout person at the supermarket. Take the time to say hello, strike up a conversation, ask how they're doing. And as you do that, prayerfully sow seeds, create opportunities in which conversations about the gospel might flourish. And then you can do the same thing. Fourthly, do it online. If you're on social media, Facebook or Instagram, or one of those platforms, be really prayerful and intentional about what you post. Don't just rant about politics or grumble about life or just share, you know, amusing pictures of your cat. Look for ways to share really good Christian content that makes people think that might start a conversation right there in your social media feed. For example, you could use one of the short answer videos that we produce at Solas. They've been used over a million times now by people to start evangelistic conversations in contexts like Facebook. Uh, there's also ministries like Alpha and Christianity Explored. have also got great resources that you can use in a similar way. More people than ever are checking out Christian content right now. So use those resources and opportunities. In fact, a few months ago, uh, The Guardian, not a newspaper uh, known for being particularly friendly to Christians, ran a major story reporting that 25% of Brits had watched a religious service or event online since lockdown began. That's a figure that rises to 33%, one in three of young adults. So online and offline, look for ways to make connections with people and to sow opportunities, uh, take advantage of opportunities to start conversations where you can sow pointers to the gospel and point to the kind of hope that we have as Christians that Christy talked about. Thanks so much, Andy. There's so many kind of practical ways in which we can engage, but how is it that we can actually make the most of these opportunities? Well, that's a great question, uh, Christy. How can we weave the gospel into conversations, everyday conversations, without looking like we are religiously mugging people? You know, the Amazon driver comes to the door, says, here's your parcel, Dr. Bannister. And I reply, why, thank you. Here's a parcel of good news for you. Cringe factor heavy. Is there a better way? Well, I find the best way, the most helpful, productive way to move a conversation towards the gospel is to prayerfully look for ways to ask good questions. Questions are a powerful evangelistic tool and they're easy to use whether you've been a Christian for six days or 60 years. And Jesus used questions all of the time. He used them to start conversations or sometimes he would use them to respond to other people's questions. For example, consider the famous story in the Gospels of Jesus and the rich young ruler. That's the young man who comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, he's saying, Jesus, you look like a good religious leader. You're a famous rabbi and moral teacher. So you obviously are going to heaven. How do I get there? And Jesus untangles that whole mess of wrong ideas with a simple question. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. You know, I find beginning with questions in a conversation really helpful. An obvious starter is how are you doing? But often as Brits, we don't go much further. So what about uh, moving to a question like how are you really doing? You know, is your job OK with all of these layoffs? Is your family OK? And depending on the answer you get, you could ask, is there any way I can help as a follow up? I also like to find ways to share honestly how I'm uh, doing, even if I'm struggling, even if it's a bad day. But then in doing that, I'm looking for ways to talk about and ask questions about, for me, what is the key issue? How do you find hope given all that's happening? I love asking people that question. Listen. Ask follow-up questions, but look for the chance to share where, as a Christian, your hope uniquely lies. And as I do that, as I ask questions, I'm also prayerfully looking for ways I can compare and contrast. As Christy shared with us a, uh, a few minutes ago, there is no hope in secularism, so look for ways to bring that contrast out. For example, a question I've been using during the pandemic uh, is finding the right opportunity to say to a friend a question like this, you know, have you ever wondered... Uh, about the fact that if we are just atoms and particles, just time plus chance plus natural selection, if this life is all that there is, then isn't COVID-19 doing us a favour? It's weeding out the weak and the sick and the elderly. It's improving the strength of the herd. But we haven't responded that way as society. Rather, we've crashed our entire economy to protect the weak and the infirm and the elderly. Why do you think that is? See, I think that reveals a profoundly Christian impulse, and I want our friends to think about that. It's a provocative question, but it connects to the fact that deep down, even our secular friends and neighbours and colleagues know in the core of their being that life is about more than survival and reproduction. What you want to do is tease out why. 
So as we talk to friends and neighbours, as we make the most of every opportunity, uh, as Paul reminds us to do in Colossians, let's, let's make sure that we ask good questions, we listen well, and as we speak, we seek not to impart our own cleverness, but to point people uh, to Jesus, to connect the conversation to Jesus. Look for any opportunity as you, uh, as you have conversations with friends and neighbours to say things like, you know, what you've just said reminds me of a story that Jesus told. Or this conversation reminds me of something that Jesus said. Or what you said there just reminds me of something that Jesus once did. Find ways to connect the conversation to Jesus. Ask good questions. Listen well. Ask more good questions. And prayerfully look for ways to connect the conversation you're having uh, to the hope and the story of Jesus. Andy, thank you. What I really love about what you've just shared is that it's just so easy, isn't it, to say this reminds me about something uh, that Jesus once said. Do you have any kind of stories as to what this might look like in practice? How does this actually work? Well, yeah, I mean, God is at work in so many ways. Let me just give you a couple of examples of, uh, of ways I've seen this. Uh, a few weeks back, uh, just uh, around Easter, my wife, who has all of the best ideas in our house, had a brilliant idea. We went and we bought a job lot of John Lennox's wonderful little book, uh, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? We popped each book into a gift bag along with, a, with an Easter egg and a little hand-drawn card my kids had drawn. And we delivered those gift bags to houses around our neighbourhood. Some houses we knew well, others we just barely knew them, but always where we had a vague connection. And we dropped the gift bag on the doorstep, rang the doorbell, stuck back the necessary two metres, and when they opened the door said a socially distanced Happy Easter. And that little gift sparked so many conversations and as people responded to us and were happy to engage and we're really excited as we come towards the end of lockdown, hopefully in a, in a short while, to begin picking up uh, the seeds that we sowed there. Second idea comes not from me but from a friend. Uh, a friend said to me that what they'd started doing was they looked to see whether their community, their street, had a, had a WhatsApp or Facebook group and it did and they joined it. And then they said they started looking for opportunities where you can step in and, and help, where somebody says, I'm struggling with something, I need some help, uh, leap in and offer to help. And when people thank you or compliment you on what you've done, be very non-British and say, look, you don't need to thank me, I'm doing this because I want to show the love of Jesus to my, to my neighbours and my community. Trust me, it may feel awkward, but you will start a conversation as people are grateful for what you've done and surprised that you haven't taken the glory, but passed it, reflected it to somebody else. And in all of this, remember, pray, 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 and pray some more. Pray for the Lord to open up opportunities. You know, you don't need to force things uh, or be false or, or to be something you're not, but it may be that uh, the Lord brings to mind opportunities or relationships or situations where maybe you've shied away from being a public Christian. And see, my prayer for each one of you uh, listening to this seminar, wherever you are, is that you'll see the Lord use you in ways you never considered before. Yeah, we live in challenging times. And, and yes, the spread of COVID-19 has made doing church and doing evangelism the old way uh, difficult, almost impossible for the moment. But let's show the world that it's not just coronavirus that can go viral. Let's grab hold of opportunities, make most of every opportunity that the Lord sends. And let's show that the gospel of Jesus can go viral too. Thanks, Andy and Christy, for such a stimulating and practical challenge for us to share our hope in Jesus with our friends and family. Now, wonderfully, we've got Andy in the studio. Welcome, Andy. Great to be with you. And Christy is online and they're here to uh, answer all, all of our questions. Uh, Andy, where have you come from this morning? I have come all the way from Dundee in Scotland, so 6 a.m. start. So, wow. Uh, yeah, lots of coffee inside me this morning. <laughs> Excellent, good. And Christy, where are you? I'm beaming in from sunny Leicestershire. Oh, it's glorious. Wonderful. Just so great to have you both with us. And uh, we've got a whole ton of questions. We're just going to uh, dive in right, uh, right now. Here's the first question. Christy, this is for you. Um, someone says, we spoke to our neighbours early on in lockdown about Christ. How do we pick up on those conversations now? Hmm. Oh, that's such an excellent question. Thank you. Um, I think Andy picked up on this in, in his talk a few minutes ago when he was saying how we cultivate conversations with friends by asking the question, how are you doing? And then how are you really doing? And particularly now, you know, we've got masks, uh, introductions of masks, there's unemployment, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty over the future as well. Mm. Those conversations are just going to continue, aren't they? So I think my biggest kind of advice would be to carry on being human and asking the next question. So 
what did you last ask them? How are they doing? And keep that relationship going. Lovely. So just keep that relational element. That's, that's really helpful. Anything to add, yeah. Sandy? Yeah, I think the main thing I'd, uh, I'd add to that is I think sometimes in, a, in evangelism, John T, we try and leap too quickly to sort of square 10. So yes. we reconnect with our friends. Yeah. And before we fully reconnected, we're straight into, you know, sort of shoehorning Christianity. Have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. In, ex exactly. Right. And so as Christy said, make that connection, find out how they're doing, take those steps, and then find that way, I think, to prayerfully, uh, you know, bring your faith into the conversation. Um, but do that through relationship, do that through hospitality. So it's a slow, steady... Yeah, play the, play, the, play the long game, or at least the medium game yeah. in your conversation. Question for you, Andy. Mm -hmm. um, what do I say to my non-Christian friend when they ask me, why is God letting so many people, including Christians, die of COVID-19? From Helena. Thanks for that question. Great question. Um, thanks, Helena, from uh, Bristol. Bristol. From Bristol. So, uh, absolutely brilliant question, uh, Helena. Thank you uh, for that. And I mentioned in my, uh, in my talk uh, one resource, which is John Lennox's yeah. uh, book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Uh, John Piper, Tom Wright have written on that as well. So I start with those because it's a big question. I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts, okay. um, but hugely encourage you to dig into some of the resources that are out there, Helena. First, I'd say a couple of things to your friends who's asking that question. First thing I would do is I would gently turn that question around. And so the question of suffering uh, and the question of where, what do we do with pain and brokenness and hurt and evil uh, force itself on all of us. And of course, if we live in a purely godless universe, then there's some conclusions that follow. And one of the conclusions that follows is that, you know, COVID-19 is a beautiful example of uh, evolution in action. Along comes the coronavirus and it's sweeping out the weak, the elderly, uh, you know, it's strengthening the herd. It's, it's doing a wonderful job mm. of survival of the fittest. But we haven't responded that way as a society. Mm. We've shielded the weak, we've crashed our economy to look after those who biologically are, are, are worth less. Um, that I find deeply, deeply fascinating. We've responded in a very Christian way as a society. So I would prod into that to start with and see how your friend uh, responds. Then the thing I'd add as well that I think is very important, Helena, Helena, is to say, look, look, Christians have always been aware that we live in a world where there's suffering. There was suffering when the first early church got going. Uh, Christians suffered terrible persecutions under the Roman Empire. Uh, there were plagues and pandemics and disease and famine and earthquakes and wars. Christians have never labored under the misconception that being a Christian renders you immune from the suffering of the world. Because we follow a Lord who, who went through and experienced that suffering and that pain. What Christianity promises you is resource to deal with that suffering. It promises you that pain and death are not the last word, and it gives you a hope that is not some kind of vague ephemeral hope, but a hope that is grounded in the very concrete fact of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So Christianity gives you these incredible resources to help see you through these kind of dark times. Psalm 23, God is with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's where I'd begin. That's very helpful. Do check out those resources and throw it back to them and um, clarify what the Christian hope is. That's very helpful. A question for you, uh, Christy. Um, a really heartfelt question from someone here. I really, and that's in bold letters, I really want my friends to be saved, but I worry about being too pushy, especially in the work mm. situation. I do try hardly any interest. Mm. I guess you can hear mm. the question there, kind of how much should I try? What should I do in this situation? Christy. <clears throat> mm, that's such a great question. Thank you for asking it. I think my uh, initial kind of thought is that if you're concerned about being too pushy, you probably aren't actually being pushy at all. And so I think I'd be wanting to think through kind of what questions, what kind of could you ask to cultivate and to build a conversation with friends in the workplace? And often I think we think, I think Andy mentioned this earlier, that evangelism is kind of going in all guns blazing. I'm going to kind of tell you all about Jesus right now. And if that's the way in which we think what it looks like to communicate the gospel, then of course that's going to be hard hitting because they might just be chatting about their weekend, but you want to talk yeah. about atonement or whatever so um i think just start small build on those relationships and as you kind of talk about your weekends you can like throw in what you've been doing about going to church or something that you just read over the weekend that really struck you and how you're kind of processing that so i wonder if yeah if you think that you're being too pushy you probably aren't and i'd probably start by just asking lots and lots of questions until they ask you one back that's lovely. Very helpful. I've got another question. I'm going to go to Andy on this one. I think this is a question which probably all of us are asking. 
How do you witness to people who are doing well and are very happy and don't see any need for Jesus and generally think that this life is all that there is? Well, a great question. Yeah, brilliant question, uh, John T, and thank you for whoever asked that. I'm going to start as I started my last answer and give you a couple of resources and then uh, give you a couple of thoughts. It's very interesting that a very uh, famous book on evangelism and giving a reason why we believe what we believe is Tim Keller's book, Reason for God, uh, that came out uh, almost 20 years ago now, I believe. But what's interesting, that book deals with the very common objections that people raise to the Christian faith. But then Tim began to realize there was a whole generation of people who weren't even interested in those questions because of exactly this reason. They were happy, they were satisfied, they saw no need for God. And so Tim Keller wrote a follow-up book called Making Sense of God. And there's some brilliant stuff in there to help you deal with, with friends uh, like this. But a couple of thoughts for you. When I meet folks who are in that kind of position, I like to do a couple of things. I like to try and look for good questions to ask, to prod uh, a little bit. One question to begin exploring with people is what happens when, uh, when those things don't work out? It's you know, very easy to think the life is great, that the job is great, the marriage is great, the kids are great, everything is wonderful. But there will come a time for, where for all of us when, uh, when life uh, deals as a, a hand of cards that is not so good. And one of the interesting things is COVID-19 and the pandemic has brought that more to the fore for many people. I have many friends and, and neighbours and, and acquaintances who, you know, life was wonderful and then suddenly they've been furloughed suddenly they've been made redundant, suddenly they've lost a family member. And I think one of the reasons that I think COVID-19 has in some ways caused a little bit of a spiritual awakening in some circles, it's forced those questions to the fore. So you can gently prod your friends, you know, what happens, have you thought about what happens when, uh, you know, life is, is not so smelling of roses? You can also turn it in the direction of justice and say, you know, you've got a wonderful life, it seems. You've got a great house, great car, great family. You know, what would you say to somebody who hasn't got the advantages that you've had? You know, we live in a world where we're far mm -hmm. more conscious of privilege. What do you say to somebody, uh, you know, who's living on the breadline, to somebody who's experienced racial injustice, uh, to somebody who has, you know, life has, uh, has uh, dealt them suffering and pain and not the advantages that, that you've had? How does your worldview help them out? And I think the powerful thing about the Christian faith, it shakes and challenges those of us who are perhaps a little bit too comfortable, and it gives uh, comfort to those who've been afflicted. Uh, and I think those are two areas I would press into. Uh, but again, Tim Keller's book, Making Sense of God, uh, lots of great resources in there for exactly uh, that type of person and that type of conversation. That's really helpful, those two lines of inquiry. I guess the third one that eventually we have to start talking about is judgment that even though your life might be perfect now, one day you have to give an account to God for the life that you've, you've lived. Absolutely right. Uh, um, Christy, over to you. Next question. Uh, what's the place of listening in evangelism? Oh, central, absolutely central. What a wonderful question. I am, um, yeah, often when we're considering how to talk with our friends, we think, okay, I have to have, we're all looking for this kind of silver bullet, aren't we, that we can just kind of put it out there and then they will repent and believe the good news. And we just overlook the, the important role of listening, don't we? So I, I actually, it's, yeah, I cannot speak of this more highly. There's a great book called Questioning Evangelism by Randy mm. Newman. And in that he talks about how is it that we can ask questions? What kind of questions can we ask? And making sure that they're open-ended questions so that our friends can actually um, respond with more than a yes or a no. So. Yeah, listening, I think, takes a central role in our evangelism because how Jesus doesn't come to us in a vacuum. Um, the eternal son takes on flesh. And, and as he lives in the creation, he's always showing, as we see in the Gospels, what it looks like to know God through the ordinary, everyday things of life, like agriculture mm. and farming. And so how do we kind of contextualize the Gospel uh, is really important when it comes to our friends. And so I think listening helps us to then know how we can give them the best answer when they then ask us. So I, again, I'd go back to the Andy and I have heard this quite a few times from a friend of ours who says, keep asking questions until they ask you a question back. So, yes, listening is central in that, I think, to be able to do that well and persuasively. That's, that's helpful. I'm seeing that's a note between both of you, actually. Questions are a massive part of our evangelism. And Randy says, actually, that's mm. a central part of Jesus' evangelism as well, isn't it? He was a great question asker. Exactly. Um, Andy, over to you. Uh, you talk about being intentional, intentional in our use of social media. Uh, do you have any examples or resources for how we can do that best? 
Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's a great question, John T. What's interesting, you know, a while ago, there were just a few of us, I think, sort of using social media. And then, you know, along came COVID-19 and every church under the sun is now kind of trying to sort of um, figure this one out. But the yeah. great thing uh, about social media, of course, is many of us, uh, hopefully all of us, but certainly many of us have probably got a good range of non-Christian friends on social media because it's just the, the nature of the beast that you tend to accumulate kind of sort of a variegated tribe. And of course, sharing stuff is really easy. You come across a great piece of content. It's very easy to share it. And uh, you can also, I think some people find it's a little bit easier to perhaps be more out there on, in terms of evangelism than maybe you might be uh, sort of one-to-one. -one. So if you're the kind of person who's nervous talking to friends or neighbors or colleagues about Jesus, maybe you can find the courage prayerfully to, to share a little bit of content on your Facebook feed. So where's a great place to start? Let me give you, uh, I'm gonna give you two uh, recommendations. Obviously there's the uh, Keswick Ministries website and everything linked through there, all great stuff. Um, <laughs> well there, Andy, thank uh, you. Thank you very much, okay, that's uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the invoice will be in the post. You can come back, yeah. Come back again. Um, two great things I'd recommend. Um, Christianity Explored, uh, Randy Newman, who uh, Christy just mentioned, has done a lot of work with them. And Christianity Explored have got some great content on their, on their website, wonderful for sharing. And then a little kind of a bit of self-promotion, the organization I work for, SOLAS, S-O-L-A-S, the SOLAS Center for Public Christianity. If you put SOLAS into, into Google or Facebook or social media or find us, we've produced over the last three years a video series called Short Answers. Uh, we've got about 75 videos now where we take a common question or challenge about the Christian faith and we produce a three or four minute uh, video answering it. It's very non-Christian friendly, uh, no cringe factor and uh, about one and a half million downloads on that series now. Go check those out and encourage you to share one. Have a look through the videos, see what you think your friends might find interesting. And the great thing is if a conversation starts on social media and you get asked a question you can't answer, there's probably another video that you could say, well, I think this might answer your question. So Christianity Explored, uh, Solas Center for Public Christianity, and just encourage you, go out there and, and share. This lunchtime, when you're not watching something from Keswick, why don't you try it? Share one of those videos on your uh, social media feed, see what happens. It's a great challenge to put out there, Andy, thank you. Christy, one for you. How do events in church interact with personal evangelism? Is it an either or? Mm, what a great question. And um, no, I don't think it is an either or. I think it's a, it's a both and in that the local church is um, is the place in which we we reach the nations, isn't it? And so it's wonderful that we have organisations such as Solas, which Andy is a part of, um, and, and other ministries as well, who are able to come alongside the local church and help local churches to be able to put on really excellent events to reach their friends and family and community. And so I wouldn't say it's um, it's an either or in competition, but it's a how do we steward the gifts that the Lord has given to his church and then be able to kind of serve and recognize that there are people who are very well placed to do this but that evangelism starts and ends in the local church and so I'd say it's it's a both and rather than either or how can we serve God's great mission um, to the world in, in partnering together to be able to do that well. Very helpful indeed. Um, a question maybe back to you again Christy. Um, hello May, sorry this is the question not me saying hi. Uh, hello, <laughs> hey, may I ask this yeah. question for the evangelism seminar, please? I have been a Christian for many years, long to share Jesus with my friends, but it always sounds so odd and unnatural coming out of my mouth. Yes, I can write and sing about him very easily. Should I accept that this is my best way of evangelizing? Mm. I always feel I'm falling short somehow in not being able to verbally sell my beliefs. Thanks. Mm. Thank you for that question. Gosh. Yes, that's such a, an honest and transparent and thoughtful question. Thank you so much for, for sending that one in. It sounds like the Lord has wonderfully gifted you in, in writing and in um, putting together hymns and songs. And if that's the case, it doesn't sound like um, you're, you're lacking a, a speaking gift, so to speak. I wonder if there's a way in which you could cultivate your writing so as to give you confidence when it comes to speaking um, verbally about who Jesus is. So if there's a way that you could perhaps write down um, what it is you'd like to say to your friends or how you'd put that and then just have that in the back of your heart or your mind and then perhaps in the next conversation you might be able to say to them, oh, I prepared this the other day or I've just been thinking about this. Would you like to listen to this or read this? Or if it's spontaneously in a conversation, perhaps you could then bring that in later too. Because again, it's, 
it's not about selling our beliefs though i think that's often how we mm. feel don't we where yeah. it's like oh i really have to stand up for jesus here and i'm the one who has to persuade them that that he is the way the truth and the life and i suppose it's just resting that we when we come to sharing the hope that we have we're doing that from a place of approval we're not doing it for approval and that the Holy Spirit is is the one who is able to convict and warm hearts to the beauty of Jesus. So, yeah, I'd, I'd really kind of uh, want to encourage you to rest in Jesus and to use the gifts that he's given you well to that end. Christy, that's great. Uh, really quick final yep. one for you, Andy. Is it, to, is it fair to say we're all evangelists for what we're passionate about? How do you help us apply this to talking to our neighbours and friends about Jesus? Yeah. I think the simple answer, John T, is absolutely, you know, whether it's our favourite football team or some great holiday we've been on or even our new phone that we've got, you know, we're very, we find that very easy to enthuse about that. Mm. But when it comes to Jesus, we sometimes clam up. Two thoughts here. I think obviously what often causes us to clam up is, is fear. It's that fear of looking stupid. It's fear of making the gospel look bad. You know, it's fear of doing more damage through opening our mouths than shutting it. I think the first thing we should do is bring that fear to the Lord and pray yeah. that Pray that through. Share that faith, share that fear with others as well. Don't be, a, don't be a lone ranger with evangelism. Find a buddy that you can share your fears with. Pray that through. Encourage one another. But then put into practice some of the things that Christy and I have shared to, uh, in the Q&A and in the seminar, especially around asking questions. Mm. It's much easier to learn to ask good questions to get the conversation going than, than imagine we have to memorize this carefully crafted gospel presentation and download it onto our friends. Be prayerfully seeking good conversations and asking that the Lord would keep you faithful and would you use those in sharing the gospel with your friends. And, uh, and then just relax a little. As Christy reminded us, remember it's the Holy Spirit's job ultimately to draw people to him. Don't take all the pressure on yourself, uh, but get out there, give it a go and see how the Lord works through you. On, on that note, let me just pray for us all. Father, thank you that we have a terrific message for the world of your son crucified for forgiveness of sins. Help us to trust him as we try to speak of him. Mm. We ask that even today you'll give us opportunities. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Guys, it's been terrific to have you with us. Thank you so much for driving me down and tuning in, um, Christy. Uh, and thanks Pleasure. for all of your wise um, wisdom that you've given us. This is the end of our seminar now for today. And next, we've got Count Everyone In with Pete and Christine Windmill. Um, this is going to be an accessible short devotion, which will be accessible uh, for all. Do come back this evening for our evening celebration with Graham Daniels. And tomorrow morning for our final session, starting at 9 um, with a prayer meeting, and then at 10 for our final Bible, final Bible reading with Chris Rash. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you soon. Hello everyone, here we are again for Count Everyone In 
at this special virtual Keswick, virtually Keswick. My name is Christine Winmill, and along with Yonica Kloss and my husband Pete, we each day are bringing you a short Bible thought, a prayer, and a Bible verse to learn, to say, to say and to sign. And today's theme is hope, because Jesus is righteous. And here's our Bible reading. It's taken from Psalm 5, verses 7 and 8. Because of your great love, I can come into your house. With deep respect, I bow down toward your holy temple. Lord, I have many enemies. Lead me in your right path. Make your way smooth and straight for me. Well, I wonder what Yannicka has to say about that. Let's listen, shall we? We know that Jesus came to live on the earth, first as a little baby, and then as a man, a person just like you and me. But there was one big difference. Jesus was a man who never did anything wrong. He did not sin. And doing the right thing is called being righteous. Now, I try to be righteous. I try not to sin. I try not to make any mistakes. But you know what? I fail every single day. I do or say things that hurt other people. I make mistakes. I'm not righteous. But Jesus knows that I can't be righteous all by myself. He knows that I need his help. And that gives me hope. Because I know that if I stay close to Jesus, he will be my friend and he will help me to do the right thing. And even if I make a mistake, I know that Jesus will forgive me. And if doing the right thing is hard or difficult, I know that Jesus will help me to do it anyway. Because Jesus loves me. Because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose again after three days so that I can be forgiven. And I know that Jesus will help me to be righteous. Well, thank you so much, Yannicka. I wonder, let's think about the decisions you have to make today. Maybe you have to make a big decision or maybe you only have to make a small one. But you know, Jesus wants to help us with each and every one of them. Let's take a moment to tell Jesus about your decision and ask him to help you to make the right choice. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are righteous. Thank you that you want me to be righteous too. Lord, I want to ask that you would help me to make the right decisions with the things that I need to do. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, Yannicka, you're going to show us again the Bible verse have we learnt it yet? Have we learnt all the signs? Well, let's join in as Yonica shares with us now. May the God who gives hope fill you with great joy. May you have perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with hope. Romans 
15, verse 13. Rionica, thank you. God, there's a lot of movement, isn't there? A lot of things to learn. But it's good to remember verses like this from the Bible. Well, that's the end of today. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Stay safe. Bye.